Welcome to The Stumbling Spirit, Contemplations on the Path of Resilience. Whether you realize it or not, you are resilient. It's your birthright. As you take in your next breath, know this truth. It's not only about your capacity to overcome difficult situations, but it's about your courage to do the necessary work to heal, learn, grow, and move forward. What you gain is invaluable wisdom. And it's through these hard stumbles in life that we often discover a new purpose that aligns with our spirit. My name is Fabio Da Silva Fernandez, Reiki master, mindfulness coach, and mystical explorer. Join me weekly as the Stumbling Spirit podcast highlights the lives of extraordinary people like you, sharing transformative stories and beneficial practices of resilience to guide you on your wellness journey. Am I in the world or is the world in me? This is the lifelong existential question that Lucille Joseph asked herself ever since experiencing a heightened glimpse of conscious awareness when she was a little girl. This inexplicable event led her on a path of questioning the nature of reality and God under the spiritual mentorship of Dr. Kenneth Mills. In her memoir, Releasement, Lucille recounts her life's journey to find answers to life's greatest mystery, consciousness. It's a pleasure to welcome spiritual seeker, mystic, and friend, Lucille Joseph to the show. Hi, Lucille. Hi, Fabio. So why don't we start with this question, what is releasement? Well, in my experience, there's many answers to that question, but In essence, for me, releasement is that experience of just being and not identifying as being anybody or anything in particular and letting all of that go, any sense of identity as a particular person in a particular place and a particular point in time and just stepping into the vastness of the mystery of just being, of just life itself and feeling the freedom of that, the openness and the releasement of that experience. And since I have been so aware of this, I've been talking with people about it. And I find that people do have these moments of releasement, as I call them. And those are things to cherish, I think. There's also an idea of allowing as well. So in your tagline, it says learning to dance with life. So there's this idea of this push pull of releasing and allowing. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, absolutely. That is for me, one of the biggest lessons that I've learned. I've always been pretty good at the other side of giving and receiving and, you know, have had a sort of ambitious life that way. And one of the most important lessons I've had is to learn to receive and that one doesn't need to fabricate and self-sustain one's life, but learn to be open and accepting and receiving. You know, in that tagline about dancing with life, I like to think of life itself as the partner. You know, we're always engaged in dancing with one other, other, dancing with circumstances and so on, but the dance with life itself is a dance of receiving the gift of life, of receiving breath, of receiving being, and the mystery of that. And I find a great releasement of energy in being open and accepting to receive and just acknowledging that there is something beyond me and my world. It's interesting because you're a spiritual seeker, yet your parents and grandparents were scientists, very logical, research-based, thinkers. And yet from a young age, you had a sense of there being something grander than the material world through a mystical experience that you had while on a beach in BC, British Columbia. Can you describe that experience for us and why it impacted you so profoundly that you would pursue the question of the essence of reality throughout your entire life? 
Yeah, that beach experience really did change everything for me. I was a child. I was, I, as far as I remember, I was about eight or nine. My family went on camping trips every summer. My, both my parents were from British Columbia. So every summer we packed up the car and this was the 1960s. So it was, you know, a 10 day drive and we would pitch our tent every night. And my parents, as you say, were very rational and logical, but they were all biologists, including my grandparents, even my grandmother was a PhD biologist, and they had a tremendous love of nature. So I grew up with that feeling very much at home in nature. So on this particular day, we were at a campsite, and I got up really early and went down to the lake. And I loved early mornings as a child, and, and uh, that sort of mysterious feeling that anything was possible. And uh, I remember standing there and there was a lake with sort of the bare outline of trees on the other side because it was very early. And, you know, I have remembered and written this down so much. I hope it's true to the, my original experience. But there was an experience of just melding into the trees and the sky and just being rooted there, but also being kind of everywhere. And it was so startling to me. I had no words or background or anything, you know, to even the concept of a non-material universe, given my upbringing in a very materialistic family, that the whole thing could just dissolve and I'd still be present was quite a discombobulating experience. But at the same time, very much an experience of home. So from that time on, I couldn't deny that there was this experience of just being without identifying as a kid or parents or anything else, and that those two things were different. And that really shaped everything. But it seemed as though in that moment, I could sort of evoke the world to come back and then blink and it would disappear again. So I, I had this idea that either the world must be in me because that's what was happening, or else that I was just another object in the world and I was just a material body. And none, neither of those two ideas made sense to me, that I was in the world or that the world was in me, neither of them. And it really wasn't until much later that I came into a felt appreciation of one consciousness, that there was something greater than both me and my world and that one of these didn't encompass the other, but both were inseparable from something much greater. And, you know, the word that we use for that often is the word consciousness, which bothers some people, or we use the word God, which bothers other people. <laughs> but it's a kind of unnameable recognition that, you know, this childhood sense of it must be within me. And we can stumble on that idea of within me, you know, because then we think it's in me, but it's not in me. I wouldn't exist at all without consciousness. I just want to explore this idea of dissolving, right? So when you say that, how I interpret it is your perception of reality expanded away from your regular perception of reality. Does that resonate? Yes, that's exactly it. And so in this expanded state or in this expansive state, are you a witness of yourself as sort of an observer of yourself and everything around you? Or is it just an awareness? In my recollection of these moments, and there's been only a handful in my life, I don't have an awareness of myself or observing myself. It's just purely awareness of, you know, sort of in the clouds, in the sky, everywhere. And then when I remember myself, I kind of come back with a bit of a thud. So it, it, you know, these kinds of experiences are fascinating and they point to a greater reality that we get glimpses of, but they in themselves are, to me at least, not the point. The point is that they remind us that things are not as they appear to be. And they give us a chance to question and challenge our rational minds and the testimony of our senses that tell us that this is all solid and three-dimensional and objective and that somehow uh, the higher order qualities like awareness, love, gratitude, feeling somehow arise out of the material world. And 
moments like these ones that we're attempting to describe here are just wonderful reminders that what if it's the other way around? What if it is an essentially non-material experience sent that the invisible realm is fundamental and the visible, the material springs out of that. I find that a fascinating question. It is a fascinating question. I do like the idea of these experiences being reminders of what actually is, as opposed to what we perceive things are based on our attachment to our identities, to our egos. But they're important reminders. And you had other reminders like that. So for example, once when you were in a theater, when you were looking around at the audience, the people, I guess they morphed into energetic blobs and they would morph in and out of form. Can you describe that? <laughs> sure. Us? Yes. This one is was in um, Massey Hall in Toronto, a wonderful concert hall, theater in Toronto, which is horseshoe shape. So I was sitting in the balcony on one side of the horseshoe and it was kind of half light. And I looked across at the people on the other side of the horseshoe. And as I looked at them, they were just blobs of flesh. They might as well have been sacks of potatoes or flour or something. There was no apparent light force. And then I kind of blinked and they were people again. It was like plugging in a light bulb. And then they would turn back into blobs. And, you know, again, I had this endlessly curious mind. And, and it felt to me like another one of these powerful reminders that the life force is not in the body. It's the light to the body. So there's no life force in my elbow or my knee. And it's not where it resides. And that it's possible to have an elbow and a knee just as an object. But there is a life force that is animating these bodies. And somehow in this um, half lighting at Massey Hall, I was seeing them with and without the life force. It was a very unusual experience. I want to clarify the experience just so that I have a better grasp and our listeners have a better grasp. So is it just that you had this recognition that the consciousness existed outside of those material bodies? Or is it that the form actually changed as well? It started with the form looking different. All the rest was consideration since and years since. But the actual experience was simply looking across and what were, you know, live human bodies somehow to my eyes looked like just inanimate blobs of flesh. I don't know <laughs> what it was or how it happened or what it meant, but it was one of those moments that taught me as a child with a very strong rational mind and, you know, being raised on the scientific method and all of that. One of those moments that it just caused me to stop in my tracks and think, I actually don't really know what's going on here at all. Like, how is that possible? <laughs> How did it feel like, so when you noticed the blobs themselves, did it have a different quality to it than when you were on the beach? What was the sense that you had in that moment? Yeah, it definitely was a different quality because I wasn't dissolving. You know, there was no sense of dissolving in that moment. I was just kind of riveted in my seat, fascinated by this and trying to keep it going, which I couldn't. I, it happened a few times and then it was gone. Yeah, we had a different quality to it. It wasn't as transporting. It was fascinating. Again, I, you know, I noticed these things and put a value on them and used them for questioning. And I think many people have experiences in their lives of altered perceptions of one kind and another. And, you know, they may have scientific biologist parents like mine who would start to give them explanations about the kind of tricks your eyes can play when you're, um, you know, in half light or things like that, which, you know, could give you a physical explanation for what's going on, which is interesting, but it doesn't really tell you, it, it, it still doesn't help to tell you that when you realize that the way our senses perceive the world is because of the nature of the senses. 
it's not that it's some fixed objective reality. We, we know so much more about that today that it's all energy, vast amounts of empty space and you know, energy moving at different rates of speed. And that's how you would experience most of these kinds of reminders is that it was a felt sense, a felt sense in terms of something that you would physically feel, but also see in terms of the a vibratory state of existence. Yes. So when I see scientific explanations like uh, Einstein's theory that light is always both wave and particle, which for a long time, quantum physicists could not prove. Light in their experiments was always switching back and forth, behaving as a wave or behaving as a particle. And finally, in 2017, scientists, quantum physicists, the first group in Italy, actually proved that light is all the time both wave and particle. And I just love that scientific theory because it goes so exactly with my own experience that we are always both wave and particle. We are essentially light. And so the fact that we're particles, we're bodies all differentiated and all different and have all of these attributes where we move around in space and age and die and so on, none of that takes away from the fact that we are also wave. We are also pure energy. We are light and that one does not mean that the other is not already present. So it's not to me as though we have to wait till some time when we're disembodied to experience being spirit. We are always that right at the same time as we are embodied. And if we think about it in that way, then it becomes less of a we and more of an I. Absolutely, it does. And that is where meeting Kenneth Mills when I was 18 was so helpful to me because until then I was working through all of these ideas and the we and the me and and how this all worked and he Kenneth Mills was a philosopher and musician with a very deep grounding in wisdom teaching and was able to declare with meaning the I am the I am that I am and was able to give me, through his language, words and metaphors and imagery and language to go with these experiences so that I could start to articulate what was going on in a way that I, you know, I couldn't as a child because I had no language for it. I do want to talk about Dr. Kenneth Mills in a moment, but I want to shine a spotlight in your early childhood within your family. So we talked about how your parents were scientists, biologists. You also had grandparents that were also in the field of science. And because of that, you lived in a household that was very, I guess, logical, very ordered. And it wasn't a household where people expressed feelings or emotions very easily. I got the sense that there was also some limited validation in terms of your artistic pursuits and your spiritual pursuits as well. I wanted to read something from page 14 in your book. You write that the unspoken message in our family was that playing with children, socializing, and even just having fun interfered with the real business of life, going to work, engaging in scientific discovery, learning something worthwhile, pursuing a career, and accomplishing something important. To what extent did that impact you? Well, certainly it did. I've had this same impelling for much of my life that it was necessary to prove myself and do something worthwhile and become something. Mine was not a family where just arriving, just being, just being born, just being a member of the family was enough. And that, you know, the child is is loved and celebrated and appreciated just for the very miracle that they're there. Mine was a family where, you know, you had to learn your scales and go to piano lessons and get an A at school and all of those things to to feel that you were worthy, that you were measuring up and that you were worthy of being loved even. And I'm sure my parents didn't intend that, 
but that was kind of the unspoken backdrop. And so we were a pretty serious family. And I funneled as much of that as I could as a child, I think, into the arts. So I took many, many arts lessons. I was learning violin and piano and ballet and drama lessons and so on. I loved all of that. But even that was to try to prove, did I have any talent? Could I make this into something worthwhile? Which put a lot of pressure on it for a kid when it could have been just a lot of fun to learn. And then when I look at my business career, I see the same kind of theme. You know, I was out chasing after success, trying to prove to myself and I'm sure to my parents. And I guess I felt I needed to prove to the world that, you know, I could be successful do something worthwhile, accomplish something. And it wasn't until much later that I finally realized that what I am, what I'm made of is already complete. It's done. It's perfect because I am. And I don't need to fabricate something else. I don't need to become somebody or something and try to you know, uphold um, a particular image or accomplish something and be seen to be something. Because that's exhausting, as I found, and I think many people do when you try to shore up and puff up a personal identity to feel like you're doing something worthwhile or that you are worthwhile. And there's a tremendous releasement in realizing that you don't need to sustain all of that, that in fact, you're not sustaining anything, you're being sustained. And it's possible to let go of all of that hamster wheel of fabrication. I find it interesting in the sense that in that household where your parents were bringing in lab experiments into the house, you know, and putting them in the fridge and all of that, that because it was a very academic household and because you had this spiritual bent, this creative bent, that you felt alone, but you were very studious, but you felt alone in that journey that you had early in life. What I found interesting in reading your book is that eventually your mom, who was a successful bacteriologist, she eventually developed her own spiritual beliefs. How influential was your mother in your spiritual journey? Well, mothers are, of course, so definitely. And for many years, it was a bit of a block because, you know, one wants to be loved by their mother. (laughs) And certainly I did. And as you say, we had this academic family with a great love of nature. And I write about some of the fun things that happen in our household when I was growing up with bringing the world of nature into the kitchen and even into the fridge and so on, which was all wonderful. And they truly had a deep, incredible appreciation of nature, which I'm very grateful for that gift. But anything in the realm of spirituality was way beyond anything that I would talk to them about. I knew it would never be acceptable. So I kept it all to myself. And I obviously had lots of imagination and creativity and was always making up plays and stories and songs and putting on shows and all of that. And that seemed to be reasonably acceptable, (laughs) Um, reined in with lots of lessons. But the journey of really discovering for myself, what do I actually believe? Because when you're a child growing up in a household, I think for a long time, it's just assumed that whatever your parents' worldview is, probably is going to be yours, starts out as yours. And then many kids, of course, take a different path and children who grew up in, for example, religious households who reject that. So for a long time, it was very much just my own journey. But I stayed close to my mom all the way through. I loved her fearlessness. She was a woman who was so unique for her generation. You know, here she was doing um, scientific research at a time that women, especially mothers, were really not doing that sort of thing. And I respected her tremendously for that. And we were very close in many ways. But I was so excited when I came home one day. And by then, I I had been working for years, and I came home for a visit. And there were these newsletters about dowsing and energy fields right there in the same stack of her usual stack of scientific journals and things that were always in the house. And I thought that was fascinating. And it turned out that as she was trying to recover from uh, rheumatoid arthritis and finding that the medication wasn't helping her, she had discovered that there was a whole other way of approaching it that had to do with energy 
that was helping her. So she started on this whole new quest. And eventually she would take her dowsing pendulum into the grocery store and dangle it over the vegetables to see which ones had mold. And <laughs> she had a wonderful spirit about it. I mean, she would just laugh about it. And she would talk about going to her woo-woo conferences and her eye of newt experiments that she was doing. And it w- it brought us really close together. And in the final years of her life, we had a wonderful time being able to talk about these things with her also having actual experiences, not just reading about it, but real experiences that really brought us together in a very magical way. That's beautiful. You didn't see eye to eye with your dad, but you had a very tender relationship with him. And it was really nice to read that and how as a child, you would assume the role of Detective Holmes and he as Watson and how he would send you flowers an opening night of a performance at at school. I thought that was wonderful. And he was so happy when you got your MBA and you guys went out to dinner. And so he was present in your life in that way. And he was also connected to nature, as you mentioned earlier, but in a Darwinian way. And the irony is, is that you are connected, but more in a spiritual way. He never got around to being open to your spiritual point of view. So I want to to get your insights around whether you feel as though you two could have had an unbiased conversation about spirituality. Hmm. Probably not with that title. But the thing that was amazing about my father was he was very creative as I indicated in some of the stories of things that he did, you know, drawing me cartoon books and recognizing important moments in my life in a marvelously spontaneous way. And he was not a communicative man and his parents were not. In fact, neither of my sets of grandparents were. So we were a pretty uncommunicative family. So my dad and I really never found words of our own to communicate some of these subjects. But we would use books and characters like Holmes and Watson. You know, we'd read T.S. Eliot together or other things like that. And we would find ways to connect through literature and words and ideas and through nature that was very powerful. And I guess one of the things that I grew up with that meant, has always meant a lot to me because of the relationship with my dad, is the importance of communication, of having conversations that was so hard and so fraught in my household that I would want every child to be in an environment where they can speak openly about their experience and express themselves openly and feel heard without anybody judging, do I agree with this? Is she right? Is she wrong? This is just where she's at. This is just who she is right now. And what a gift it is for children who are in that kind of environment and I think that's that whole impelling of the need to express, of being so expressive and being in a family where that was so difficult is one reason why today I'm so keen on trying to express by writing a book and hosting forums and hopefully stimulating conversations because today conversations about spirituality are easier than they were a decade ago, for sure, much easier but still difficult because we don't have common language and we don't know what each other is talking about when we use certain words. And it has become a very private pursuit for many people. And I think one of the important things for bringing ourselves back together in community is being able to have conversations about this topic. One of the reasons I cited your parents' stance on spirituality was the fact that they were scientists. But also what influenced their position on religion was your grandfather, your father's father. What I found interesting was that he lived in India for a time and he noticed how the missionaries there were forcing conversions on the locals. And he was horrified by what the Church of England was doing. Can you tell us a little bit about him? Sure. 
I was fairly young when he died, but I remember him as a lively spirit who, you know, definitely had opinions about things and very hardworking. He was quite rebellious as a young man, as a child. He, if you go back far enough on my dad's side of the family, there are missionaries who were in India converting people to Christianity. By the time my grandfather's father, so my great-grandfather, worked for the uh, railway company, he was not a missionary. But still, it was you know, very much present in the family. So my grandfather was born there, and then he went to boarding school in England. And you know, by the time he was in his kind of mid to late teens, he'd had enough of all of this and came to Canada and went as far as he could. He went all the way to Victoria on the west coast of Canada. And then he got a ranch land. They were doing land grants in British Columbia at that time and you know, became a farmer. They, had, they milked cows. He and my grandmother milked cows every day and delivered milk and were determined that their sons would get an education and would not have to work on the farm. But my father, my grandfather's early experience of these missionaries and the Church of England and all caused him to be really strongly against the Christian church and what it was doing. And I have that side in me still. I can feel it strongly. I can easily have this sort of reflexive reaction to anything to do with the church. And yet I have almost no experience with it. So I have no right to do that. And certainly no right to judge any missionary. I've never even met one. But these things get passed down in generations of families. So there is a side to me that comes directly from all of that sort of embrace of science and materialism and kind of 20th century view of the world of evolution and genetics and that we can explain everything through the rational mind and that everything to do with a spiritual aspect of life was simply as yet unexplained situations and people had a need to make something up. So they developed these beliefs. And once we understand everything from a scientific point of view, we won't need all those beliefs anymore. And so I, I started to think of, of the idea of God being like a kind of plug number. If we don't know what's going on. We'll just call it God. And once we know all the you know, variables, then we won't need that anymore. And that was kind of the environment I grew up in, the environment my dad grew up in. And yet I always felt his artistic nature. And I think if he had grown up in a different place, he would have had a different sensibility about him, perhaps. I don't know. Who knows? I found it interesting. I mean, you just mentioned now that you still have this reaction to the church and to religion. And yet as a child, even though you were in a secular household, religion and Christianity was ever present. You would go to school, you'd have to say the Lord's Prayer, you went to Girl Guides. There was this Christian ideology that sort of permeated throughout the different systems that you belonged to. And the only person that you were able to talk to about spirituality was your friend Diana from the Netherlands. Can you talk to us a little bit about that friendship and the importance of it to you at that time? Sure. Diana was a friend of mine in high school. We both lived in Thornhill, just outside of Toronto. And her family was from the Netherlands, as you say. And they were a strongly Christian family. And everything was right, wrong, good and bad. And Diana was constantly told exactly what to do and how to behave. And it gave her a lot of confidence because she knew what to do and what was right and what was wrong. <laughs> and uh, it really gave her a structure in life that, you know, I didn't have. I mean, my parents told me everything was relative. You know, there is no right and wrong. You've got to find yourself and explore. And, you know, this very academic sort of way of raising children. We never, my sister and I really never knew where the guidelines were or the guardrails because there really weren't too many. And so we had developed this very questioning, analytical way of looking at things. And there was Diana with a very specific, this is the way it is based on the Christian church way of looking at things. So it gave me a wonderful kind of foil. And I was for her as well, because of course, as she was becoming a teenager, she was questioning a lot of things too. So we had these great conversations. And because neither of us had really, we, we knew we didn't know what we were talking about yet. Um, we were able to try things on each other and ask each other questions and sort of debate things back and forth. 
so that was a wonderful opportunity for me. And we, we went to Europe together, as one did in the 70s. And uh, the two of us staying with her family in the Netherlands and my family in England. And seeing her family and how all the kids had all of these instructions and that there was just no question about what was good and bad and right and wrong and how to behave and everything else. It was fascinating to me. And I, that was when I sort of realized that my family was probably an outlier, that, you know, not having all of that was probably unusual. And yet it has given me a freedom to kind of see a lot of things from a distance, from a, with some perspective to both be participating in something, but also be able to see it from a bit of a distance and, and question it in a way that perhaps is, is harder to get to if you grow up with one worldview being the absolute right one. Let's talk about your spiritual mentor, Dr. Kenneth Mills. You mentioned earlier that you were 18 years old when you met him for the first time. That was back in 1974. And you were introduced to him in such an odd way through <laughs> your high school English teacher and your school counselor. What was it about their telling of Dr. Mills that gave you an inkling that attending a lecture by him was important. You know, the odd thing about it, as you say, it was odd in a way, is that they told me almost nothing and they were falling over backwards to not tell me anything because they were teachers in the public school system. So they were very aware of not influencing anyone in the school. But um, my English teacher, as you say, Terry McGrath, was a truly remarkable genius English teacher and I went to a school that was somewhat of a free school. Uh, we got to pick our courses, which meant really that we were picking our teachers. And so I was picking Terry every term because he was a fabulous English teacher. And that was my favorite subject. And we studied all kinds of interesting literature and music. But he was very emotionally unstable from one day to the next. You didn't really know what was going to come into the classroom. And he was much more interested in what he was in language and what he was teaching us than he was actually in us. So you just kind of had to hang on and get through the term. And then all of a sudden, when I was in grade 13, he came in in September and he was wearing a suit and real shoes, which we'd never seen before. And his hair was cut. And he announced that he wanted us to call him Mr. McGrath, which in our free school was just, you, we might as well have been asked to call him. I don't know what, but he was immovable about this. And he was all of a sudden in a much more stable place mentally and emotionally. And he had a hugely developed interest in us all of a sudden and in our potential and in what we could accomplish that he'd never had before. So it was very striking for all of us in the classroom. You, you couldn't miss it. We were all puzzled by it. And then um, because we were a grade 13 class, we talked to this guidance counselor, Colin Morrison, about our plans for graduating. And Colin Morrison also had something about him that was very stable and calm. He also seemed to have this really immovable center about him that was very different than everyone else. So I asked him how he was able to be so calm. And he finally told me that he had a teacher, which... I thought it was very unusual that a teacher would have a teacher. And I didn't really know what to say, but I felt the significance of his comment. So I asked him, what's his name? And he said, Kenneth Mills. And in my recollection of this encounter, the world really did just kind of stop for a moment. It just stopped. And this thought flashed into my mind. This is what I've been waiting for all my life. And that was kind of the end of the conversation. And later on, I was thinking, well, you know, Mills is a common name. There's nothing special about this name. And I'm not aware of ever waiting for anything. I'm not waiting for anything. What is all this about? So it was really a non-rational, precognitive kind of recognition that was a bit destabilizing. And so then finally, I, I kind of put it together. And I thought, I bet it's this Kenneth Mills that Terry McGrath has been influenced by. So I asked him and he reluctantly said, yes, it is. So I wanted to meet this man that had been so transformative of my teachers. 
And so finally, um, I was able to attend one of his lectures. And I had just turned 18, which for Kenneth Mills was the youngest that you could attend without permission from your parents. And I certainly wasn't going to ask them. So that was the first time that I went to hear this man speak, who was a piano teacher in Willowdale, just south of where I lived. And I'd taken piano lessons all my life. He knew the piano teachers I'd had. They all knew him. He wasn't some strange, mysterious character, you know, on a mountain somewhere. But he had found that he had this gift of speaking spontaneously of what he had come to realize in his life. And so I went to one of his lectures. I didn't understand a word of it, but I felt that I had received something significant and there was something moving in me that was coming alive that I wasn't fabricating. It was just happening. And this became an impelling that I, I just found I, I had to follow for myself. And it's a, a very unusual experience to have this kind of deep recognition on the one hand, but of something that is completely unfamiliar on the other. It's hard to describe, but it's experienceable. He was somewhat of a controversial figure, right? Because he was referred to by some as a cult leader, but he never aspired to be followed, nor did he want to be, and he didn't want to have a legacy either, to the point that he didn't even want any of his recordings and written words to exist. He wanted them destroyed after his death. And it was interesting also to see that he did not even want to be referred to as a spiritual teacher, but rather as a, a force of realignment. How would you describe Kenneth Mills? Well, I think force of realignment is a pretty good description. My experience of encountering him was often an experience of a kind of reversal where everything in my life, sort of day-to-day -day life that seemed important and real and tangible would become kind of irrelevant and just sort of on the surface and not that important and ideas and words that could sound kind of abstract and academic, like God or consciousness or the feeling, the being or being, allness, oneness, all of these words that can be just so abstract or meaningless, suddenly were infused with a tremendous significance and force of reality and immediacy and power. And this would be my experience of being around him was that I could step into a different level of awareness where I could find tangibility in ideas like consciousness or being or soul in a way that in the rest of my life, it just didn't come to me in that way. For me, he was that kind of transforming force that helped me get in touch with my own sense of what I am in essence. I would also describe him as a mentor because I could call him and ask him about experiences that I was having or situations I was in. And when I would tell him about a realization I'd had or something that had happened, you know, he would be the first one to celebrate and, and understand it and recognize it and be able to share in it and amplify it in his own way or describe his experience that would continue to open up mine. And at the same time, when I was off wandering in the woods somewhere <laughs> in my mind and um, kind of off the track, he would be the first one to catch me up and say, you know, wake up. This is not what you're here to do. This is not what you're about. And he would never tell me directly in that way. He would never use words like that. He would only ever speak from his own experience and remind me of what was possible in my experience but I always had to do the work myself. No one can ever give these things to you. He was a very charismatic man. And certainly in the 70s, when cults seemed to be rampant, he was definitely tarred with that brush. And, and I can certainly see why people would. You know, he was, he was an artist. He was a performer. He was a pianist and composer and conductor. And he lived fearlessly exactly what he understood to be reality and uh, what constituted living life from the standpoint of what he knew to be true. And he never compromised for anybody. For people that he rubbed the wrong way, he just did. He did nothing to compromise or ingratiate himself. And, and as you say, he, 
he didn't aspire to, you know, establish some church or something like that. He would always say he was only speaking from his own experience and that it was pertinent to him and his own experience. So if you can imagine a man who's a piano teacher and a concert pianist finding himself suddenly with hundreds of people around him wanting to be with him and hear him speak and phoning him all the time, wanting to come and see him and so on. I mean, how would you cope with that to have that transition in your life? And yet he was willing. He just made an agreement within himself that he would speak to people if he were asked. And if he were not, he would just continue his life in his own way. And it was really all the same to him, but he was willing, if asked, to fulfill this gift that had been given to him. It sounds like he had a real presence about him, so much so that I think that if you were to just base it on the page, because you were taken aback at the words God and how we referred to God as father, mother. So it was really a bit of a leap of faith that you took to see him for the first time. Had you just based it on the transcript, maybe you wouldn't have gone at all. That's true. And I saw the transcript after I met him. So the way it works is he speaks spontaneously and it's recorded. So they created a transcript, typed up a transcript of his remarks the evening I went to hear him speak. So it was a few days later that I got a copy of it. Of course, I'd heard him using these words, but there was lots and lots of words I didn't recognize and couldn't follow. And um, you're exactly right. I mean, I thought that this was, you know, kind of a new age spiritual teaching. And why is he using words like God? And then worse, father, mother. I mean, I was 18. I'd had enough of father and mother. I didn't want to know I had another one. And I didn't know what's around. And so I realized that this was going to be something that I was going to have to wrestle with if I was going to continue to hear his lectures because his background is exactly the opposite of mine. He grew up in a Baptist family in St. Stephen, New Brunswick. And his family you know, was very religious, so he knew all his Bible stories and grew up with all of that. And he refused to be baptized, by the way, until he was, I think, almost 20, because he didn't want to do it until he knew what it meant and it had some meaning for him. And when he found within himself symbolically what it could actually mean, as a metaphor, then he went ahead and did it. But then as, a, as an adult, for a time he was married to a woman who was in the Christian Science Church. So he studied Christian science, and that was a great influence on him. And then after that, he went to hear the Maharishi Mahesh speak a number of times, spoke with him privately on a number of occasions, received a mantra and so on. And that was another great influence in his life. So he had these Western and Eastern influences but he somehow within himself through his own deep inquiry, you know, every day of his life, as far as I can tell, came into his own realization of the nature of reality. And the words came to him to express what that was, which was essentially that if something is real, it is unchanging. And so that everything in the changeable realm of, you know, us <laughs> and circumstances is ultimately not real, but is the evidence of that reality, but that there is a higher reality beyond the mind, which is unchanging, that you might call consciousness. And over the years, he's drawn on East and West and different traditions to use different kinds of language to express that. But his home key is definitely Christianity. It's the blasted Christian church that I grew up to not um, believe in. And so for years, that was a stumbling block for me. And so I had to really re-examine all of my own assumptions about that word and about religion and try to see how does someone who's coming at this from my background become comfortable with the idea that this is a non-material experience and that there is a reality beyond the rational mind. Earlier, you mentioned that Dr. Mills would deliver spontaneous lectures, which are called unfoldments. In the book, you say that he was not in a trance, yet the words were very poetic and spontaneous. So how would you describe an unfoldment? That's exactly what it was. He would just sit down, often in front of several hundred people, many of whom he did not know, and get out the microphone 
and say, what are we going to talk about? <laughs> and can you imagine the trust, the releasement that it would take to do that, to just sit there and be open and know that the words would come and have that grounded authenticity to just be prepared to receive and be open to what is going to be received. And as you say, he was not in trance. So he would sit, he would often be quiet for a moment, and then he would begin and he would usually start with the date. So he would say, this is the evening of whatever it was, and we are here in whatever, such and such a place. And then he would just leap. And the opening few sentences would usually define what the rest of the lecture would be about. But he would have no notes, have done no specific preparation. And he would speak for most of the time. It was about an hour. Earlier on, it was a lot longer because he spoke very slowly. And he sometimes spoke for three or four hours at a time. But um, by the time I met him, he was speaking much like we would. And so it would sound like normal conversation. <laughs> And then he would launch into poetry, perfect rhythmic rhyming poetry spontaneously, which is, as I later learned, an oral tradition that does happen in different places, like Rumi would be a famous example of that. In Poland, when we were there, they told us about their spontaneous poets. But it's a great experience of spontaneity and releasement of being willing to just do that. And then when he would open the floor to questions afterwards, he would still be in that same state and would continue to respond and with poems and, and so on to people's questions. And so then you knew that it was spontaneous. And sometimes, of course, he, he did read from books or he would arrive with a particular thing that he wanted to tell us. I mean, that would sometimes happen as well. But most of the time he would just launch. And so he was as interested as we were to read the transcript. And he would say, I hear it as I give it, but I don't put it all together until I hear it again afterwards or I see it on paper. So I would sometimes look at his transcripts and he'd marked it up, you know, he'd underline things and he'd look up words to see what the root of a word was and how that related to something he said at the beginning. He was as much a student of it as anyone and so much humility about it. He was just amazed by it. He was truly in awe of it. He saw it as a great gift. It, it was always moving to me to see his own attitude towards this gift that he'd been given, which I still cannot explain. And fortunately, these lectures were recorded. And some of us who loved them and felt that the world needed more wisdom, not less, pressed him when he said, I don't want these to be misinterpreted after my lifetime. This was pertinent to me. This was just my expression. You know, throw it all out when I die. And we were all horrified. And so he agreed late in his life to let us call through the library and keep a library of these lectures, which we've done. And so there is a foundation, the Kenneth Mills Foundation, which holds his intellectual property. And fortunately, there are still video and audio recordings of, of these lectures. He died in 2004, so 20 years ago. So they're now, in a way, historical. You know, his life, he's a, he's a historical figure now, of course. But the message is timeless and universal as, you know, you would find something of, you know, Ramana Maharshi or the Buddha or St. Francis or any of the teachers and speakers, Gurdjieff, you know, so many through the ages and poets and so on that they, they were of their time, but what they had to say endures. You say that meeting Dr. Mills changed your life forever. Can you share what your favorite Kenneth Mills statements or unfoldments are? Sure. Yes, I have a couple here that I really like that kind of express what he had to say. So Kenneth Mills was an incredible wordsmith. So I'm going to just share a few quotes. Do you ever stop to consider how you pass your days, your precious days, because you chose them in order to experience not the vicissitudes of life in a form, but to experience how you can live vibrantly and successfully with a form, but not be caught by it. So I think that's a great example of the mysteriousness of some of Dr. Mills's words, but also the clarity of them and how he always pointed to the fact that 
we have this life in a form and we are that, but we are also more than that. And that with technique, it's possible to live in the form without being limited by it. And that's to me, a lifelong quest is to be able to do that, to have the artfulness and intentionality of living, to be able to be here in the form and doing all the usual things, but to not be caught by the limits of it. And, you know, as we've talked about earlier, one way to do that is this remembrance of just being, of this now in this moment, it's not past or future, it just is now being, is, is one way to not be caught by it. It's one of the exits. Here's another statement, a similar idea, expressed in a different way by Kenneth Mills. If you free life, capital L, from the limits of living, you will find that living is only the outer garment of being. Who would ever realize by looking at you that you are the actual presence of living unconditional love? That's brilliant. Yes, isn't that beautiful? I mean, there's so many. Another facet of Dr. Mills, because of being a musician, and he worked with musicians and singers all his life, created music all his life. And one of my favorite simple statements from him is, you are, in essence, sound being. And that's one of those statements that just rings true to me. And I just think, yes, that's what I am. <laughs> sound being. Yeah, that makes sense. Everything is vibration. What I found interesting, too, is that there's also a word vibration as well. He has impacted your life in the sense that he suggested a new name for you. Your original name is Elizabeth, but it is now Lucille. And it was because he suggested it for you. And he also said, you know, you could just have people call you Lucy. And then you found out from your mom that she had intended to call you Lucy when you were born. That's right. Yes, this is the most um, sort of controversial and slightly mind-blowing chapter in my book. Yes, my name was Elizabeth when I was growing up. I hated the name and it was very formal. And my mother called me Elizabeth. My dad called me Liz my sister, my, or Lizzie. My sister called me Liz. And my name was always a thing growing up because I never liked it. And so I had this opportunity for Dr. Mills one day was greeting people by name, couldn't remember my name. So he could tell that I didn't like my name. <laughs> and so he actually did suggest the name Lucille. And you know, what a radical thing for anybody to do. I was about 19 years old and I loved the sound right from the first time I heard it. And the meaning of the word Lucille is light. So I loved that. And then I had this incredible conversation with my mother. I mean, my father and sister were horrified that I would change my name and that somebody else would give me a name. <laughs> it's a crazy radical thing to do. But then I sat down with my mom we were in the kitchen where mom and I always had our chats over a cup of tea. And I was telling her about this name and you know, maybe, you know, Lucy. And she just got tears in her eyes. And she said, that was my mother's name. My mother's name was Lucy Clemens. And I wanted to call you Lucy. But our last name at the time was Fowl. And she thought Lucy Fowl was a terrible sounding name. <laughs> she would never saddle her daughter with a name like that. So she had never told me this story, and I didn't know my grandmother's name. My grandmother died years before I was born. So neither Dr. Mills or I knew this story. And so then all of a sudden, this was my name because my mom had chosen it for me, because it was my grandmother's name, and because it was this sound frequency that Dr. Mills had offered me as a much more flowing and light sound than the, you know, sort of very formal name that I'd had before. So it was a very powerful experience for me. And he also gave it to me as a sound frequency with a very unusual spelling, uh, which helped me not associate it so much with the word. Because of course, the word in our culture, especially at the time, even still today, was associated with Lucille Ball and guitars and country western songs. And it's a very old fashioned name. Nobody had that name. And so it was a good experience for me of, you know, standing on my own two feet to adopt the name in spite of, you know, a lot of objections around me. It was an experience of resilience, I would say, 
to uh, to stay with it and own it and make it my own. You mentioned earlier that uh, Kenneth Mills was a musician and composer, but a successful one at that. He was also a fashion designer and an obvious natural when it came to poetry and being an orator. You yourself have had a lifelong love affair with ballet, music, various art forms, including writing. And you were also one of the founders of the Luminato Festival. And you're also a patron of the arts. What is the connection, do you think, between cultivating spirituality and the arts? Ah, for me, this runs very deep, you know, right back to my childhood of not having any avenue for spirituality in the pure sense of the word, but having all kinds of opportunities to explore the arts. So the arts became my avenue for exploring feeling and being and the nature of being and life and what that's all about. So the two for me throughout my life have been inextricable. And that was one of the real joys of meeting Kenneth Mills because that was the same for him. Absolutely, he would make no distinction. And so he worked with a group of singers called the Starscape Singers who became incredibly fine musicians and singers and toured all over the world many times and have many recordings performed in Carnegie Hall. And their experience as singers was not that different from my experience of listening to unfoldments and contemplation and study. You know, it's a different form, it's a sound form, but that same experience of being something non-material, of the substantiality of sound, of energy as our substantive nature can be experienced through, through singing and music just as much as through speaking and listening or writing. And it's really all the same, different forms of expression of the same thing. And one of the important things I think at this time is that at a time when so many of us are not in churches or places that would have a spiritual label on them, the arts have really become those cathedrals for many people. I know many people, as you say, I, I love ballet and often go to the ballet and talk to people who have seen a performance and they talk about being transported and the experience of grace of watching a ballet and it just takes them out of their everyday world into some, another place. And that's the same place as far as I'm concerned. It's all the same territory approached different ways and sometimes more easily without words. You know, I've had in my experience recently some stressful times because of a, a loved one being ill and it became really impossible for me to write, which is unusual because I, I like to write and I keep a journal and it's one of my primary form of expression. So I found myself sitting down at the piano and just playing the piano and pouring feeling into the piano and, and using even little exercises like figuring out the fingering for a new piece as just a way of bringing a sense of calm and order and that principle ordered universe back into my experience and the beauty and feeling and transporting nature of music. And I was grateful to be able to turn to music at a time when writing words just seemed to be beyond me. Speaking of Starscape singers, you were a part of that troupe, not only as a performer, but also you worked behind the scenes as well, organizing events. But I really love this story about one time your rehearsal and you couldn't quite sing on pitch. And Dr. Mill said to you, tilt the cup to receive the notes, which you understood to mean essentially release the resistance and allow the notes to flow through you. You were then able to sing effortlessly. You see this as an important lesson, what do you think actually happened and why did it impact you so greatly? It was an important lesson. It was a very important moment in my life. Yes, I had an opportunity to sing with Starscape, which was very exciting. And there I was standing in the line, uh, attempting to sing this note, uh, which was a high note for me. And it came out kind of like a squeak. And so Dr. Mills is at home completely as a conductor or anything musical, was conducting the singers. And he came over to me and he stood in front of me 
And he lifted his hands and tilted his head back. And as you just said, he said, tilt your head to receive the notes. They're not in your voice. You're receiving them. And I just imitated his gesture. I didn't think about it at all. And all of a sudden, this huge sound poured in with this big wave of energy. And somehow out of that, I acquired a whole new octave of soprano range. It's, it's inexplicable. I mean, I, I could not explain what happened. Something vibratorily, vibrationally happened there that opened up a whole new range for me. And I guess what it means to me is, is a number of things. One is there's such a tendency, certainly for me, probably for many people, to try to produce the sound, to work harder, to strain more, to come up with the sound with enough breath, with enough oomph to get it out there. And this idea that you could relax and receive it was a whole new idea. And so it, it just relax the vocal cords and envision it coming in instead of coming out, which is a very different image. And, you know, it's not a magical, you know, just go home and try it and it'll just happen like that. Um, it's a metaphor. It's an image to hold the mind in place while something beyond the mind is happening that's pretty magical. But it meant for me as a life lesson that I have this tendency in many aspects of my life to work hard and prepare and try to plan for all contingencies and that kind of thing without a lot of sense of trust of letting go, letting God, as they say, and allowing myself to be guided and acknowledging that there is something beyond me and my world and my mind and just asking, may I receive the words or the state or the notes that are in keeping with my highest self that would be an expression of the highest form of being that I can experience. And in an attitude of humility and asking and receiving, a whole other aspect of my experience opened up that was a lot less stressful, I have to say, <laughs> than trying to produce everything in my life. He also pointed out to me on another occasion that the difficulty I sometimes had keeping the pitch was the same issue. I was thinking so much about producing the sound that I wasn't just listening to hear the sound, that you have to be still to be silent and still and hear the actual sound and then just express what you're hearing instead of trying to focus on producing something. So it became an analogy for me for lots of things in my life. It makes sense to me because I often hear artists say that what they create isn't theirs, that it's mm -hmm. divine inspiration, that it's almost channeled through them. There are just so many examples of how you were so connected to and are still connected with Kenneth Mills. And I found this one really interesting. So even though you are non-religious, and I guess later in life, Kenneth Mills was non-religious, even though he had that Baptist and Christian science background. The both of you had a mystical experience involving St. Francis of Assisi. Can you explain that connection and what happened? Sure, I can tell you what happened in my case. Each of us was in Assisi at a different time. I was there in about 2002, I think it was. Loved it. Amazing place to be. Very busy. We were there in the summer, my husband and I. And we went up to the Hermitage, which is up on the side of the hill in Assisi, which is where it is said St. Francis and his disciples were, and monks were for generations later. And we walked into the building, and for some reason we went down this little flight of stairs, and we walked into a little room, and I was immediately seized by the familiarity of this room. There was something about the dimensions of it and where the doors were. And then there was this skinny window way up near the ceiling. I've been in this room. And then I realized that it was exactly the room that I had dreamt many, many times as a teenager. I had this recurring dream of being in a little room. It was very confining. Uh, there was a chair. I was sitting on a chair. Sometimes there was a table, sometimes not. Sometimes some water, sometimes nothing. 
and I was it, tediously in this room and then finally would walk across the room and there was a door on the other side of the room. I would go out that door and walk up a set of stone steps to a lawn it was a beautiful meadow filled with wildflowers and a huge view of this big, beautiful valley. And it was always sunny and gorgeous and the birds were singing. And that was always the end of the dream. I would end up in this meadow. So standing in the room at, at the Hermitage, I said to my husband, if we open that door on the other side and there's a stone staircase going up to the left, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And so we went across, we opened the door and there was my steps. There they were exactly as I dreamt them. And we walked up to the steps. And now today it's all manicured and it's the, you know, the lawn of the Hermitage and down below is the town of Assisi. And, but the view is the same, the sort of cliff down to the valley. And so I, I didn't know what to do. I was sobbing. I just sank down on a big boulder and just sat and cried for a while. I just to have a dream that I hadn't thought about for decades suddenly come to life as an actual place. You know, as an analytical kid, you know, I had all kinds of theories what the dream meant. I was analyzing it and I never occurred to me that it was an actual place. And then we, when we went back in, you know, my husband asked me, do, you know, do you want to go back and see your room again? So we went back in and of course, this time it was filled with tourists. It was like any other room. And I realized, wow, the first time we went in, there was nobody there. It was just us all that time, which seems kind of magical too. So I did talk to Dr. Mills about it, and he acknowledged that this would be a recognition from another lifetime, probably, and told me about his own experience of going to Assisi and the recognition of the one who greeted him. There was a monk there. He was in the main church, in the small church that is said to be the St. Francis Church, and the powerful experience of recognition that he had there and with this man who obviously recognized that he was something very special in that space. And so we just kind of sat and, and acknowledged the mystery of perhaps a connection from many, many years ago to this one place that, who knows, the mind can never explain these things. But it was a, a beautiful and powerful moment to know that he had also had a great recognition and remembrance in Assisi, as I did. Yeah, I really resonated with that story. and. Probably the reason is that St. Francis of Assisi was a mystic himself. And so it's interesting how you both had this profound mystical experience with a mystic or related to a mystic. Besides delivering unfoldments, Kenneth Mills also believed in the importance of meditation. And he guided you and others to do the same. It's also called the practice of presence. Why is presence important? And how did Dr. Mills help you cultivate your mindfulness practice? Yes, he um, wouldn't have called it that at the time. Mindfulness is a word that has come into usage really since his day, but very much presence is important and being in the moment and not thinking about what's just happened or what's coming up, but being very present. And he would do things to wake us up and see if we actually were present. And I recount in the book one story about presence. When I was at the Boston Consulting Group, I was in the midst of a um, major project where I was consulting and had a large team of consultants working with me on a project for a very bureaucratic client. And we were right in the final stages about to go and do our final presentation. And I had a phone call scheduled with Dr. Mills about something. It was probably something to do with a concert or some activity that was going on. So I phoned him and we covered the topic. He asked me about the weather and I hadn't actually looked outside for ages because I was so wrapped up in this project. So that was my first return to presence. So he, he then gave me this little poem, which I scribbled down on the back of one of the pages of this document that we were preparing for the client. And I told him, that we had this big project going on and that we were calling it Making Change Happen for this huge bureaucratic client that was stuck. And Dr. Mills said to me, you are not there to make change happen. Your very presence is the happening. And then he hung up and I was left at my desk with this powerful statement of presence 
with this huge stack of research and analysis and pages and pages of documents for this client, where I suddenly just knew that presence is the happening, presence is the answer. And we can do all the charts and analysis and organizational restructuring and process mapping and everything else that we want to do. But the only thing that will change anything is presence, not just mine, but anybody's. So the next day we went, we flew to um, the client's uh, head office, did the presentation to their senior executive team. I did not throw out the whole deck, which I was thinking of doing, but I didn't have the courage to do that. But I was now grounded in this fact that presence is the happening. And we did a whole day of meetings with various people around the company who were always expressing to us all the problems and the reason why nothing was possible and so on. And I just stayed with that idea that presence is the happening. And that if you claim a different state of presence, everything will be different. And some people really caught that spirit and realized that they were self-sustaining a lot of these things, keeping it all going and were so comfortable in it all. It was the way they lived. And if you changed your thought and changed your outlook and adopted a different state of presence, a lot of this would just dissolve. And I'm not sure that a lot changed for the client that day, but a lot changed for me that day because I realized that all of this analysis and everything else that I was doing was fine. But what was really important about all of my work, anywhere I am, whatever I'm doing, is the state of presence. And that presence is the only thing that is actually transformative. And so in another conversation with him, uh, he defined a a CEO as the chief energy officer. (laughs) So I adopted that as well. And in any situation, especially uh, when I find myself in a leadership situation, I always remember that, that the CEO is the chief energy officer. So through presence, through energetic presence, any one of us in a leadership role sets the tone, which reverberates for everyone else, and they align to that vibration. And you really are controlling the energy level to a certain extent for other people because they pick it up in your presence and in your thought field. We're much more attuned to each other than I think we acknowledge beyond words. And uh, it can be, of course, transforming in any organization or any situation that the presence that the one in a leadership role brings to it. And it was a great lesson in presence. It's also through presence that you connect with God consciousness. And that is one thing that Dr. Mills illustrated to you in a very creative way one day when he placed a beach towel over your head and his head. And it was an aha moment for you because it explained or it answered that lifelong question of, am I in the world or is the world in me? Can you describe that moment for us? Sure. That was a moment of extremity for me. I was up in at the Sunscape Inn in Muskoka and feeling like I wasn't understanding anything and that this was all just kind of academic and intellectual and I really wasn't experiencing in a deep way, whatever it was Dr. Mills was talking about. I didn't know what he meant by consciousness. And I still hadn't answered my childhood question, am I in the world or is the world in me? And there I was. I was about 20 years old or something by this time. So I decided in sort of this feeling of extremity that I would go over and just pay him an unscheduled visit, which one seldom did. There were hundreds of us there. So a lot of demands on his time. So I just walked over to where he was staying on the campus and he was about to go down for a swim. And so he was very gracious and greeted me and invited me to sit down. There was a couple of those Muskoka chairs on the lawn overlooking the lake. So we sat down and I don't remember exactly what I said, but I do have a recording of some of it because his associate, John, was there with a tape recorder, which was fantastic. So he recorded some of the conversation And the essence of it was this moment when Dr. Mills took his beach towel and he put it over my head and then he put the other end of it over his head and he said, so are we separate under this? We appear to be, but are we in essence? 
And somehow, just sitting there in these Muskoka chairs under a beach towel, I had the experience that we were not actually, in essence, separate, that the substance of our being was one and the same. And I knew that for the first time. I knew that as an experience for the first time. It was a huge breakthrough for me. I, it brings tears to my eyes even now remembering it because it was the first time that I sort of got beyond this idea that somehow everything was within me or I was just a thing in everything else and gave me a whole new perspective and a whole new experience that there was something substantial that I wasn't separate from and that that's what I was tasting. That's what I was touching, that inseparability of all, of allness. And, you know, it was not necessary to try to attribute that to a person. You couldn't possibly put the greater into the lesser, but that if I could experience that, I was not just a mere mortal who didn't know anything and was trying to figure things out. If it was possible for me to have that knowingness, I must be that. And, and that was the beginning of really having a felt tangible experience of something beyond me and my world. And it's a concept of non-duality that Kenneth Mills conveyed throughout his entire life. Oh, yes. That was the premise of his life and his work. And he, with his Christian background, often put it in the framework of, I and my father is one now and not shall be. So for people who believe that that statement, I and my father are one, is attributable only to Jesus, this is uh, a provocative way of rewording it. To Dr. Mills, what Jesus offered in his tremendous accomplishment opened possibilities and set an example of what was possible, that the Christ is a state that is achievable. It's not about one person. And so he claimed for one and all that this fact is true, that I and my father is one, and that that is true now. It's not something that we'll grow into or progress to or, you know, after many lifetimes somehow get to. It is the actual fact now. What is God? And is God and God consciousness the same? Well, I, I would say that for me, God and God consciousness are just different labels, different words for the same thing. Yeah, what is God? <laughs> God is a concept that we make up to have a word to describe this unfathomable, unknowable state that is the source of our existence. I, I don't think I could really offer a definition beyond that. One conversation I had with Dr. Mills, he, he pointed to the sun as a corresponding identity in the three-dimensional realm of the life-giving force that is all of God consciousness. And so like the sun, that is the light to all and that no existence could exist without it in the same way that consciousness, that center and circumference of our very being is in essence all there is. And that Life, truth, and love is the substance of my being. That's what it is. It's just a knowingness. And we put lots of words to it. And as we've talked about, you know, the word God has always been a thorny one for me. So being a good strategy consultant, I spend a lot of time trying to change it as a brand in my mind to get the old branding of the way I thought of the word out and open myself to different uh, branding, different way of understanding. But I find it easier to use different words like life-giving force or creative source or mind or consciousness. These are all just words that point to different facets of what that must be, that what must be in order for us to be. Let's talk about branding. I thought that this was a very interesting part of your book where you wanted to explore how we could as a society rebrand God. And you did quite a bit of research. And part of that research was sort of understanding where are we in society in terms of belief systems? Do people have a religious affiliation? Are they just spiritual? Do they believe in a higher power? So you did all of this work. And you also understood that where we are in time is that there's this idea of individual attainment. But at the same time, I found it really ironic that in that individual attainment, that people are searching for community as well. What else did you discover in that research and in your quest of rebranding God? 
The research was fascinating and it happened before the pandemic. And then there was these years of the pandemic when there was no research. And so, you know, with all my years of professional consulting, I was worried about putting in my book research that was now quite dated. <laughs> and so it's quite su in summarized form in the book, but it was fascinating. And I'm planning to update it actually, because it was very interesting. One of these main themes was people doing an individual quest. So they would, you know, watch what's available now online is tremendous of different teachers and speakers. And so much of it is very fine. I, I don't know a lot of it, but some of the things I've seen, I think is wonderful. And yet they would find themselves, as they described it, only talking to themselves, only their own mind was dictating what they liked, what they didn't like, what they agreed with, what they didn't agree with. And so there's a limit to what you can do by yourself, because it's usually someone else who brings a different point of view and punctures some of your beliefs about things that actually, you know, need to be punctured. And we very seldom do that for ourselves. And so since today, people seem to be very reluctant to have a teacher. I met very few people who would ever be willing to do the kind of thing that I did was actually study with someone over a number of years and allow them to know you well enough that they would really actually influence your life like that. It's, a, it's not something that many people would be willing to do. And it's a risky thing, of course, if you encounter someone who you know, wants to diminish rather than augment your experience. But the answer to then, then what is community. And I think that that's one of the things we're going to start to see more and more is how do we create conversation and community and people coming together without any particular belief system in common, but with a sense of inquiry and a sense of urgency. And we are living in a world with crises from side to side. And where will we build the resilience to have um, an inner core that's stable enough that we know where we stand and that through our presence, we can start to have an effect on what is around us and I think that communities um, and people just getting together in whatever way, on whatever basis, is really important. And I've been doing a, a series of, of forums, bringing people together to try to do some of this in different ways. And I hope that other, lots of other people are doing that as well. I think it's very important at this time. You say that we're going through a palate cleansing phase of releasement. <laughs> Can you describe <laughs> what that means? <laughs> Yes. I, when I was uh, doing a series of focus groups, people would sort of tentatively say, well, I know there must be something greater and they wouldn't want to define it because they didn't want to go back into their Sunday school upbringing or whatever it was. And so they were trying to find language and an openness within themselves to considering new ideas that because they were not satisfied with just a materialist point of view and the success in their lives. And you know, these people were all meditating and doing different things, but they wanted more. And they knew that there was a facet. I mean, there's so much spirituality today doesn't really incorporate the idea of spirit exactly. It's more sort of self-care and these kinds of things, which is all fine. But for these people, they wanted to enter into a higher state of awareness and a greater realization of the nature of being and found themselves without the language to do that and without a path to do that. And it seemed to me that people were very focused on letting go of things. They were letting go of their religious upbringing or they were letting go of their atheist upbringing or they were letting go of their rational mind beliefs or whatever it was, and just open to something new without wanting to define it. So it felt to me like a kind of palate cleansing, that there was this step that we were taking where we were no longer as convinced as we were 10 or 15 years ago that science had all the answers. We're no longer as convinced that connectivity through IT is going to bring us together. We're no longer as convinced that the rational mind can explain everything and substitute for things like church. And yet we don't know what comes after church. We don't know what's going to emerge next. 
but I feel like something will because we are at an extremity where we need a deeper foundation in our lives and we need to come into a fuller sense of what's going on here that's not just about people and their egotistical preferences in order to come together and create the world that we want to live in. And are we going to be able to do that without the belief system of a particular religion to rally around? Or how is this all going to happen? So I kind of described it as a palate cleansing phase that's very individualistic, that I hope will lead to some forms of community and conversation and expression that will bring back into the public realm more acceptable conversation about the totality of our being, including the invisible as well as visible aspects of our being, and including presence, and including that thorny word of God consciousness. So your spiritual mentor, Dr. Mills, Dr. Kenneth Mills, passed away in 2004. How did that event impact you? Well, it was a tremendous impact on my life because so much of my activity was surrounding things that he was doing. And, you know, I had notebooks and notebooks of word lists of his spontaneous lectures. And so those books were closed forever. And this friendship that I had of someone I could call, someone that I could go and see, someone I could have over to dinner. My husband and I often had Dr. Mills over for dinner and we'd talk about things. That was all over. And I wondered if I was going to find myself now in a world where there was no one to have the conversation with, you know, no one to really continue to grow and explore and how would that all happen? And yet I knew from Dr. Mills, having said it so many times, that it's not in him. He would always tell us it's not in me. Anything you see in me is all within yourself. And so I just trusted that there would be the years in my life where I could continue to deepen and find that paths continuing to unfold for me and that I would find wonderful beings to connect with and continue to have these conversations and to continue to feel that sense of affinity with others on the way, which I'm very grateful to have found has been my experience. And I have continued to listen to recordings of his unfoldments. And in a way, years after he died was a great time to then listen because I had the luxury of just listening to it just as ideas and could listen to it several times. He wasn't about to give another one the next day. And I started to think, wow, did I ever really realize exactly what he was saying? Or I was hearing it differently. It was continuing to unfold for me in a different way. So I have a very different relationship with the material now than I did 20 years ago, not surprisingly. And I'm grateful to continue to still have a relationship with it. Not that I don't have my own voice and my own experience and written a book and doing my own activities, but it continues to be kind of my home key. And I'm grateful to have that kind of tuning fork in my life where I can return to it when I want to and hear the sound and the pitch. And it re-evokes for me those moments and the kind of room within myself that I built in relationship to Kenneth Mills that is still my own experience. That tuning fork, his words still help you. And in fact, you had an acute case of chronic fatigue syndrome a few years ago, and you read these words, rejoice in the ever newness of being. And just in those words, you knew what to do to get better. Can you describe that road to recovery and how his words helped you? Yes. So this, uh, as you say, was at the beginning stages quite acute. I didn't know if I was ever going to be able to exert again without feeling ill. And we went to see various doctors and so on. And I was advised that I should try to do a couple of minutes a day on a recumbent bicycle and see if I could build up the minutes without becoming nauseous and headache and so on. And if I was able to do even a little bit of exertion and for weeks and weeks, I couldn't. And I was ready to give up and just realize that this was all beyond me. When I remembered this statement that Dr. Mills had said to me 
years and years ago when I was being very serious and earnest and wanting to do the right thing. And he said, oh, rejoice in the ever newness of being. This is great fun. And I thought being is ever new. The ever newness of being is actually happening right now. And if being can be ever new, then my experience can change and it will restore. And it just gave me the confidence to keep going. And gradually I found that I could, and I just kept going back to that idea. And also the statement that the body is where rhythm and harmony and perfection reside. And I just held to those statements over and over again. And I also gave myself a program for my own study and meditation. So I used John Kabat-Zinn's wonderful book, the full catastrophe to do inner body scans and meditations and so on, lying in bed. And then I started listening to music and I started reading and I just used all of the words and music and these declarations to build within myself enough of a force of presence that I could start to feel like I could be whole again. And it took quite a long time, but it eventually it all came back. And as a result of that, then I, I realized what was actually important to me. And I made myself a list, which I still live by and make sure that I do, that I have time alone. I have time in nature. I keep music in my life and powerful words that I never forget about the ever newness of being <laughs> and all these other important aspects and, and exercise when you can't exert and then you find that you can exercise becomes a magical thing. It's not a, a nasty thing. And so those experiences were, were a powerful example for me of the practicality of what I had learned because, you know, I, I just couldn't adopt this idea that I was, you know, people describe themselves as, you know, fighting for their health or being in a fight over their illness and trying to win and so on. Mine was not like that at all. I, I made mine a, a love in, as I say in the book, and just allowed the love and the beingness to just help me to heal. I know he didn't want it, but what do you think the legacy of Dr. Kenneth Mills is? It's a very good question and one that I've wondered about. I'm not sure that I could answer that. And I'm probably not the person to answer it because it won't be me or anyone else who knew him that will really define that. But I hope that people will find in his words and his music, a kind of prescience of our time and future times, that there's a message there that is universal and timeless, that I think people with their greater openness to these ideas today I mean, people today seem to just accept the idea that what you hold in thought is going to impact your experience, for example, and that this is a natural idea to young people. And I think they could be very open to finding his message and what he had to say quite accessible in a way that those of us in the 70s and 80s and 90s were more struggling with because these were ideas that were not so widely accepted and, and known at that time. So... I hope that his body of work in the form of at least some of his lectures and some of his music will endure and that it will find a home with people in the future who will find it valuable as I did. And I've shared his lectures with a number of people over the last 20 years and have been amazed and gratified by how much they benefit that they derive from them, regardless of the fact that they never knew the man. So I'm quite certain that it stands alone and can endure. What do you think your legacy is? Or what would you want your legacy to be? I have always had the deepest respect for anyone who as an author or speaker or poet or artist has contributed to our collective understanding and appreciation of this great adventure and gift of life that we have. And if I can say anything or do anything or write anything that would contribute to that collective conversation, that would be a great privilege. And that would be all that I would ever hope for. And you have with this book, with Releasement, Learning to Dance with Life. Dr. Mills was your teacher, your, your spiritual mentor. Why are spiritual teachers important 
in cultivating a spiritual path. Because they can readily see the limitations of the one before them, if they're skilled as a mentor, and help them find a way through those limitations. I think to try to do it alone is difficult. And a mentor, if they have that clarity, can see you or me or anyone and see their possibilities, see their total freedom and total potential and be able to help them open up and access that. I think we often don't know what our own potential and possibilities are. And to have someone who can see that and encourage it and cultivate it and sometimes, you know, give you a good swift kick to make sure that you do find it is a great thing. And I know that there were times when I wouldn't have stretched and grown in ways that I have if it weren't for his encouragement and in some cases insistence that I not, for example, quit something that I was finding hard. And he would say, it's a situation where you're growing. It will help you grow. Hang in and just do it because it will help you grow. And I would have walked away, but he could see how my having a hesitation about that aspect of, of life and living would be a limitation for me and that I should get through it and should I should just get over it and that this would be my chance to do it. And so, you know, I found that he, as a mentor, often encouraged me beyond what I thought I could do and opened up opportunities for me that I wouldn't have, have dreamed of myself. And I think a good mentor does that for us. What does resilience mean to you? Well, I actually looked up the word in the dictionary <laughs> and the root of it is to leap and the word back. So leap back or rebound. And I think that's a wonderful root of the word because perhaps resilience is that ability to regain our equanimity and joy and positioning in life where our intention would have us be in the face of circumstances or moments or emotions or thoughts that would throw us off. And of course, those come up all the time. And I think the resilience is that ability to return to the center, to never totally lose our positioning and to leap back to where we want to be, whether that's physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. That's perhaps one way of looking at it. And it's such an interesting word, which is what makes your podcast so interesting. There's so many facets to it. And perhaps releasement is one aspect of how to be resilient, is to be willing to release and receive and let go of control. And find, when you find yourself in a situation where it feels challenging, to be willing to trust and follow a prompting of the heart or of a intuition and not just the mind that's maybe telling you don't do this or whatever and just to go with it. And so I think releasement can be a form of resilience, one of many forms of resilience. You mentioned some of the aspects of your lifelong prescription to maintain health on every level. Can you Describe other practices of resilience that you have. Well, one of them that I've had for years that I describe in the book that's one of my favorites is looking in a mirror and laughing. It's a simple thing to do. One time when I was quite young, Dr. Mills noticed that I was in an overwrought emotional state and suggested that I go and look in a mirror and laugh. So I did right away. I just went right up to this bathroom on the second floor and looked in the mirror and forced myself to laugh. And I found that it broke the emotions immediately. And I was clearly not the one in the emotional state. I was the one gently laughing at this face in the mirror that was in an emotional state. And so I think there's many techniques for getting that distance where you can know within yourself, I may be feeling frustrated in this moment, but I'm not the frustration. I'm the one observing the frustration or I may be feeling uncertain or anxious or stressed, but you know it doesn't take a minute to realize that as conscious awareness, I'm not stressed. Conscious awareness is not stressed. It's not anxious. It's not frustrated. And so any techniques that we can do to help remind us of that, that what we are in essence isn't touched by these things, helps us to take them with more equanimity, to see them come and go, 
sometimes I greet them. Oh, there you are again, frustration. I see you. <laughs> and and just try to sort of laugh at it gently, not take it too seriously. And remember that it's just all part of this passing picture, this incredible panoply of life that we're in. And find a way to have that releasement of being in the world and not of it, or you know, being in our emotions, not of it, or as Dr. Mill so eloquently put it, um, to experience how to live vibrantly and successfully with a form, but not be caught by it. All of the techniques related to that, I think, are my primary practice. Another practice for me that's very important is use of language. We can be so casual in words that we adopt, and then we claim things for ourselves that are limiting by saying, I'm sick, or I don't have this, or I'm not that, I can't do this. And that type of language serves to limit us. And simply by changing our language, we can keep the door open on our freedom by just constructing our sentences differently and getting some distance on various conditions that are not things that we want to claim as our home key, as our primary state. And so that language is another vital way of gaining some perspective and equanimity on our day-to-day -day experience. How can people reach you if they want to contact you? And how can they purchase your book? So I have a website, lucillejoseph.ca, and they can order the book through the website. The book is available on Amazon in Canada and in the United States. And it's called Releasement, Learning to Dance with Life. And it is also in some bookstores surrounding the Toronto area, up in the Blue Mountain area and Prince Edward County and Orangeville and some other places. Thank you so much, Lucille. It was an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for sharing your insights, your wisdom, your experience. I know that you will be helping a lot of people. Well, thank you, Fabio, for this opportunity and for your wonderful podcast series. I'm very honored to be part of it. Thank you for listening to The Stumbling Spirit, Contemplations on the Path of Resilience. This is Fabio da Silva Fernandez. Join me again next week for another episode of transformative stories and beneficial practices to guide you on your wellness journey. If you wish, you can follow and DM me on Instagram at The Stumbling Spirit. Until next time, take a deep breath and another step forward on your path of resilience.